Greetings everyone and welcome back to another in-depth comprehensive review on a tech product that I've actually not taken a look at on the channel before and that is a mini PC. A lot of people have asked me to cover a lot more computer related stuff but I just haven't really found anything that's worth reviewing. Apart from some cheaper laptops and stuff, mini PCs themselves I honestly haven't had too much experience with. I had a Gigabyte Bricks that had a Celeron in it that I ran emulators on but that's about it. All my computers that I've got I've mainly cobbled together with bits and pieces and stuff and it's worked perfectly fine and just personally, I've never been in the market for mini PCs. Times have changed. 10 years ago, mini PCs were very meh, but now technology is advanced and we've got some pretty decent offerings. So the mini PC that I'm going to be reviewing today was sent out to me by B-Link and I've heard of them before actually, but they contacted me and asked me if I'd like to have a look at one of their new mini PCs. I kind of want to get rid of my Xeon PC in the lounge room and replace it with something a little bit smaller. So I said, sure, I'll take a look at it. And especially with the specifications, I'm really excited about this one. So massive thank you to B-Link for sending this out to me. I really do appreciate it and I hope I'm going to be able to deliver a very comprehensive review and cover as much as I can with a mini PC. There's only so much that I can do with computer stuff as opposed to phones and all that, but I will do my absolute best. So thank you very much to B-Link for sending this product out to me. And if you are interested in this product, there are links in the description below. They're not affiliate links or anything like that. They're just there for your convenience. You're not obliged to click them or anything like that. If you want to Google them, that's absolutely fine. And I just also want to clarify that I'm not being paid for this review. All opinions in this video are my own and I haven't been influenced by B-Link or anything like that to praise the product. Everything that I'm going to say about this computer is going to be my absolute honest opinion, but I'm hoping this is going to turn out to be a positive review anyways. Now, while I say that I want to do a in-depth review, I kind of want to look at this product from a consumer standpoint as well. While I'm going to be quite technical within this review, I'll try my best to look at this as I've just purchased this as a consumer. I don't know too much about this. Let's see what I can do sort of thing, if that makes sense. All right, before we get onto the listing and pricing, the usual timestamps are in the description below, so feel free to use them if you need to skip past, well, the listing that I'm going to go through, and of course, the general rambling here and there. So they're there if you need to skip along. No problems if you have to do that. But without further ado, the B-Link Sur 6 Max currently is 619 US dollars from B-Link's official website. But they've got an $80 promotion on at the moment that finishes on the 23rd of September 2023. And that's 80 US dollars off, meaning that the price then jumps down to 539 US dollars, which I did quickly check. And that's about $833 Australian. And I actually went ahead and started to purchase one of these units on B-Link's official website website to see if there were any other costs associated with this, but it seems like 539 US dollars is what you'll pay for this. Shipping seems to be free and there's no shipping tax on top as far as I can tell, but I could be incorrect about the shipping tax. That's something that I'm not quite sure about. But regardless, the retail price of 619 US dollars is pretty good for what it is, considering that I quickly went on to Senecom here in Australia to check to see what mini PCs are available within that cost. And I found these on Senecom and all of these are 16 gigabytes of RAM. Some are i5, some i7, and a normal tower just there, but just ignore that. So already from my point of view, without having to build a computer, it just arrives in the box with everything installed onto it. I think the price is actually pretty decent. Let's go over the most important specifications of the B-Link Sur 6 Max. The CPU is an AMD Ryzen 7 7735HS, which is an octa-core processor with 16 threads, a 3.2 gigahertz base clock, and a turbo frequency of 4.75 gigahertz. It also has a TDP of 54 watts and is based on a six nanometer manufacturing process. Graphics-wise, we have integrated Radeon 680M graphics with 12 cores and is clocked at 2.2 gigahertz. We have 32 gigabytes of DDR5, a one terabyte M.2 2280 PCIe 4.0 SSD. The cooling system is the usual fan and heatsink, but it's quite sophisticated and I will show you this very soon. This mini PC can also do quad display with HDMI display port and dual USB 4. You can get it in four colorways, green, obsidian black, orange, and space gray. I did kind of ask them for red, so I hope they've sent me orange. It's close enough, I guess. In the audio department, no built-in speakers or anything like that. We've just got two 3.5mm headphone jacks on the front and back. We've got Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, one year of warranty, which is good. And the AC adapter is 19 volt at 5.26 amps. But we'll take a look at it properly when I start unboxing it. Now, I'll quickly just breeze over some of the advertising for the Sur 6 Max. So one thing that this mini PC has that I'm very interested in is that it has a magnetic power supply like MagSafe. And as you can see, the reasons for recommendation is the whole magnetic power supply. And you get dual USB 4, which I didn't even know that USB 4 was a thing. Taking a better look at the cooling system, which I'm actually going to do the teardown before I power on the PC, because I want to show you all the innards and expandability and stuff before benchmarks and all that. I just think it makes more sense. But the cooling system has 
the fan, heat fins, and vapor chamber straight on top of the CPU on the motherboard, which seems to take up most of the real estate of the motherboard. And there's a thing called MSC Technology System Fan, which seems to be another fan on top of the SSD and RAM, which reduces temperatures. Finally, we have some benchmark results for the Radeon 680M, which is an RDNA 2 graphics card. CSGO runs up to 115 FPS, League of Legends 159 FPS, Dota 2 at 116 FPS, and PUBG at 92 FPS. But it doesn't say what quality you can run them at. I'm of course going to be doing my own gaming test throughout this video, and I do have a few games in mind that should push the performance of this little PC. Alright, that's everything in regards to pricing, the listing, and advertising, specifications, all that sort of stuff. Let's go ahead and unbox this so I can show you the mini PC, show you the ports and stuff like that. We'll tear it down and see what we can do with this thing. And taking only three days from China to Australia, I have a box. They sent it via DHL for me, so it was super speedy to get here. I'm not too sure of the shipping from B-Link's website, if they ship it via DHL for everybody, or if they just only do that for reviewers and stuff. And there it is. You can't really see the box too well, but we've got B-Link, so six series, and the box is actually fairly minimalistic, but I've also just seen dark green and UK. Well, I did say red, maybe they just thought I was being silly. It looked red in one of the advertisements. Seeing UK there, hopefully I can just plug in a standard lead and I should be right. And at the bottom of the box, we see that I've got the 500 gigabyte storage option, which I was promised a one terabyte one, and I've done the introduction with one terabyte pricing, but the 500 gigabyte one is only $20 less bring it to 599 US dollars retail. If I were a consumer and I did order a one terabyte option and I see that I've got 500 gig, I'd kind of be a bit upset there. And opening up the box, that's gonna hit my camera. Oh, it says, hello, how you doing? Uh, we get the user manual here, which we really don't need to go through because it's basically just plug it in, power it up. Windows is there, that's it. I'm actually not too sure if this runs Windows 10 or Windows 11 either. That wasn't made clear in the specifications. Thank you for your choice. During the system boot, if you cannot log in to your personal account, please turn off Wi-Fi and LAN. Please peel off this film before using. I will. And there's a little orange ribbon there, which holds the PC in place. Inside of the box, we get the power adapter. They have given me a UK plug, but luckily it's just the standard three pin laptop power lead. So these are easy to come by and I've got plenty of them laying around. That's also not an issue. Once again, from a consumer standpoint, if you did order this and this happened, then you'd have to go out and find one of these cables. But luckily they're easy to come across. Most computer shops sell them for a couple of dollars. So it's not too bad. We get an HDMI cable. We also get this tiny little HDMI cable. I actually bought a capture card the other day and I needed a tiny little HDMI cable for it so that's perfect. We also get a mounting bracket so you can attach the mini PC to the back of your monitor to save space. And screws as well. All right and the power supply. Oh it's made by Huntkey. I haven't seen Huntkey in a while. This is a 120 watt AC adapter and it's 19 volt at 6.32 amps. The magnetic power supply connection looks a little something like that. You know what that looks like? You know when you go to the hospitals and they stick those things on you? That's what it looks like right there. Taking the film off we get our first look at the mini PC. So the whole PC is made of metal, which is quite nice. And you can actually see the top fan just through this mesh layer just over the top. B-Link logo and the six Max just there. At the sides, you can see straight through to the innards of the PC, plenty of ventilation, so it's good to see. At the front of the PC, we have a CMOS reset button, headphone jack, Type-C USB, as well as a Type-A USB 3.2 port and a power button. Other side, more ventilation at the bottom we have this. I'm not sure what that does. And then we have please remove before using. So that's the magnetic power supply just there. Ryzen 7, AMD, all that good stuff. And it seems to just be four screws to get into it, which makes upgradability super easy. I've just realized what this is. Once you take the four screws out, you can just lift on this and it pops out. The power supply, do that. There it is. And that's fairly solidly connected. So obviously sitting on a flat surface, that's not going to get pulled out or anything like that. And yeah, it definitely does give you more room for the back, which on the back, we have the 2.5 gigabit LAN port, two USB 2.0 ports, display port, HDMI, headphone jack, and the two Type-C USB 4 ports, which as I said earlier, I didn't even know existed. And we can also see the fins on the heatsink right through there. So the fan will just exhaust all of the air out the back. Now, as I said, this whole thing is made of metal and does feel really premium, but it actually has quite a lot of heft to it, which is good to see. It doesn't feel like a cheap generic thing. It actually has that premium feeling to it. And there's also rubber feet on the bottom as well to stop it from sliding around wherever you put it. Taking the four screws out, you can then just use this at the bottom. To pop it off, and that's it. Here is the first bit of cooling. So we have a thermal pad there for 
an optional standard M.2 SSD. Good to see expandability right there. Even though it says HDD disk, maybe there's an additional accessory for a SATA connection. And there's the little tiny fan just there, which we'll get a better look at soon because we've got another four screws by the looks of it. Okay, so two screws hold a little protective bracket over the M.2 slot. That M.2 slot is M keyed and uses PCI 4.0. If you plan to upgrade the RAM in this, just take note that the extra M.2 connection has a flex cable just going underneath the heatsink, so don't just rip that straight off. So to actually remove this top piece, there's also a hidden screw just down the bottom left corner, which has to come out first, and then you get access to the innards. So I disconnect the fan and the power cable, and that is the fan, the magnetic power supply, the cable, and another thermal pad just there. So taking the SSD out reveals that it is a 500 gigabyte. Bit unfortunate that I didn't get one terabyte, but I can easily upgrade that. That's not an issue. We also have the connector for the second SSD. So if you can actually see on the motherboard, it says the Sur 7 right there. Maybe there's no difference between the Sur 7 and Sur 6. Not too sure about that one, actually. We have the two 16 gigabyte DDR5 modules, and that's what they look like. That's the first time I'm seeing a DDR5 module. I've never held one, but both those are SODIM modules. We do have the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth card just there. Now I can't quite take this out because they've bolted it in place, but I should be able to just lift this out and turn this over. Over. And there we go. There is the big fan over the heatsink on the motherboard. There is some plastic inside of the casing, but it is all aluminium for the most part. I just want to get a look at the heatsink on this. I won't take the heatsink off because I want to leave the factory applied thermal paste as it is. Taking three screws out, I can lift up the fan and reveal the vapor chamber just there, which I thought the surface area would have been a little bit bigger, but as it is, it's straight over the processor and by the looks of it, the VRM as well. Hi, sorry for the janky edit, but I was editing the video, was ready to publish it and everything until I just seen, and I don't know if you noticed it as well, but there's only three screws holding down the heatsink to the CPU. And that is definitely not by design. That is definitely a mistake from B-Link. Looking back over my original footage, there was only three screws holding the heatsink down to the motherboard, then the additional one on the little silver piece to the side, and it was missing that one screw. I've disassembled the unit, put a screw that fit perfectly in there, and I've just retested Cinebench and stuff, and luckily the temperatures are pretty much exactly the same. There may have been a one to two degrees difference during testing, so it is very lucky that I did notice this at the last minute because I would have hated to publish this review praising this and to see that the processor, the brains of this PC is missing one screw is just quite a bit concerning, especially with the price tag as well. I mean, these manufacturing defects do happen and I'm lucky it happened to me, but hopefully this does not affect anyone else who does purchase this PC. And I will stick to my conclusion at the end of this video, but I will just say that with this little flaw, I'm definitely going to have to contact B-Link about this and let them know because that is just something that should not happen. That's a very important thing to have four screws down on the heatsink to the processor to make sure you have adequate cooling or else you're going to get unbalanced thermals and all that sort of stuff. So as I said, hopefully this is just a one-off thing, but I'm glad I spotted it before I published this. So hopefully this cooling is going to be adequate enough. I'm having slight difficulties putting this back together. And because I've got a camera in front of me, it's making it really difficult to actually see what I'm doing because all the screws are different sizes and obviously they have to go in the exact same places as they came out. And I'm having trouble putting one at the top right corner. So I've got to take the whole thing apart and then put it back together and it should be fine. Let me go ahead and do that, and we'll be right back. I eventually got the PC back together off camera. It was just a little bit difficult because some of the screws are different lengths and I wasn't keeping track of them, so that was kind of my fault there. But for an average consumer to want to upgrade the SSD and the RAM, it is a bit finicky to get to those, but you only have to do it once, so I guess it's not too bad. But it is good that the second M.2 SSD is easily accessible by just removing the four screws at the bottom. Otherwise, that's everything that I have to show you around this PC. So I think it's time that we finally set this up, start testing this out, and see what this little PC can do. Booting the B-Link SO6 Max straight into the BIOS menu just by spamming delete on startup, we get all the usual options in here like specifications, drive configuration, boot settings, security, and more. Also, if you didn't notice, this is called the B-Link SO6 Pro Max, but anyways, uh, there's no overclocking options available, which is quite understandable for a mini PC. The option would have been kind of nice to see, but I think what is already in this is going to be more than enough. 
Booting up the PC first time, I was hoping for Windows 10, but instead we have Windows 11 Pro. I just can't wrap my head around Windows 11, so I would much rather suggest to reinstall Windows 10 on this. If you know how to, or if you want to experiment a little bit, you can always install a Linux distro on this, depending if that's your thing. Boot times on the Sur6 Max are fairly good, taking roughly 22 seconds from pressing the power button to the Windows boot sound. It may of course depend on what programs you have loading with Windows, and maybe if you do get the 1TB SSD option, you may get some improved boot speeds, but it's perfectly fine for what it is. Setting up Windows 11 was fairly straightforward, and it didn't ask me to actually sign into an email to continue setup, which was a bonus. Once things had set up, I was ready to start testing out this PC. Customizing this to my liking and checking the specs within Windows shows our Ryzen 7 processor, our 32GB of RAM, Windows 11 Pro installed, and the 500GB boot drive. Performance is extremely snappy as to be expected from this configuration, and I really do dislike Windows 11. Some things really just don't make sense within this OS. Microsoft really went a bit silly with this one, and you'll see just here I wasn't able to install an app off my USB due to the user account control complaining about it. It's the only app that complained about it though, and this was only just fraps, which I didn't end up using anyways. I tried to switch to UAC off and Google had to fix this, but I gave up and just went with MSI Afterburner. At this point I've installed CPU-Z and GPU-Z just to double check clock speeds and all other information. At the top left is core temp running and max temperature it had got to at this point was 63 degrees Celsius, and I'm happy to say even with both fans on this PC it runs extremely quiet. It's only when you have this PC at a high usage you'll start to hear the fans kick in, but even then it's very minimal. Our 32 gigs of DDR5 runs at 2400 MHz or 4800 mega transfers per second, and is made by Crucial as seen earlier. GPU-Z shows our Radeon GPU, but doesn't show all information. This is my error as I didn't update GPU-Z and the AMD drivers until later on, but we can see performance with this very soon. Checking SSD speeds, we got 3,786 megabytes for the read speed and 1,737 megabytes for the write speed, which to me, that's extremely good. Obviously, there are faster SSDs out there, so if you want to upgrade this with an even speedier one in the future, then you absolutely can. Here is a 4K video that's running at 140 megabits per second, and it runs without any problems whatsoever. MSI Afterburner stats are shown on screen showing the CPU temperature getting a bit higher, but it's still within the threshold. Running YouTube in Google Chrome with the usual Costa Rica in 4K test, this time actually at 4K, there are no problems with this, it runs perfectly fine, and the video didn't need to buffer or anything, so I'm very happy with this. Alright, time to check Cinebench R23, which, like my phone reviews, is like Geekbench. We get some numbers to tell us how well the processor does in single and multi-core scenarios. The higher the score, the better. And with the multi-core test, we got 13,452, which got a similar score to an Intel Core i7-10700K, as well as the Ryzen 3800X, which does indicate having some fairly beefy hardware in such a small form factor. The single core test came back as 1,554, which is right on par with the Apple M1 Max, but it's also very close to the Intel i5. 11600K, and with the multi-core being utilized the most, from my point of view this is all looking extremely good, but since I don't dabble with newer hardware, it all seems excellent to me anyways. While running Cinebench, the temperatures hit 80 degrees Celsius, but once again the fans kicked in and helped to cool things down, and stayed fairly quiet. I'll demonstrate fan noise levels afterwards. Here comes gaming, and starting off strong with Cyberpunk 2077. At 1080p with mostly medium and some high settings, I was seeing an average of about 35 FPS, which is definitely more than playable, and still looked amazing in both day and night. GPU usage was 100% most of the time, which is completely normal, and temperatures hovered around 72 degrees Celsius to 78 degrees Celsius while gaming. Now, I did put it down to 720p and low settings, and it started to get around 50 FPS, which is a bit more optimal. Even on 720p, the game still looks pretty good. And for the fun, I did bump everything up to the absolute highest I could at 1080p, and well, this is how it ran. Safe to say this wouldn't be optimal, but it's worth showing just how nice this game does look though, and if you haven't played Cyberpunk 2077 yet, I highly recommend doing so, as it's a lot more stable than when it was first released. Next up is GTA 5, a game I can't believe is going to be 10 years old in a few days, but with 1080p and with pretty much everything cranked up to high, it ran fairly solid at about 40 FPS on average. 
but I did see it jump to 60 and beyond in a few places. Just a few small tweaks to the settings with this and you'd see a constant 60 FPS out of this no problems, and for a 10 year old game it still holds up graphics wise. And of course, we couldn't leave out Doom, so here is Doom Eternal at 1080p with mostly high settings, and it was running at about the 30fps mark and did fluctuate a bit higher, but I was able to still play through it and it looked amazing. My preference is Doom 2016, but people are still using Eternal as a benchmark, which being the newer game, makes sense. Bobbing down to 720p, I was getting a steady 60fps which provided a much better playing experience, but like GTA 5, with some small tweaks to the graphics options, leaving it on 1080p, I'd expect to see close to the 60fps mark on this, which honestly for integrated graphics is really good. As mentioned earlier, I'm just not up to date with modern hardware, so to see games running at almost 60fps with integrated graphics, and this being better, since we have AMD Radeon graphics integrated, it is quite good, and once I test the Geekom PC with an i9 processor and integrated Intel graphics, we'll see which one runs better at the end of the day. Otherwise, that's all for what I need to show with this PC, so let me cut back to the desk and give you a conclusion and give you my final thoughts, and I think we can finish this one up. And we're back. I think that's everything that I needed to test on the Sur6 Max. I really tried to think what else I could demonstrate on this PC to reflect on performance, and I think with what I've shown, it's more than enough. I could have done 4K video rendering, but I kind of use a really outdated video editor, so probably wouldn't have been a good demonstration in the end. But before we jump into the conclusion, I'll splice in the fan noise at both idle and 100% usage. This is the fan noise of the B-Link Sur6 Max, just on idle. And this is the B-Link Sur6 Max fan noise at 100% usage. There's definitely a lot of air being pushed out the back of the unit, so just make sure to keep this in a well-ventilated area, and you shouldn't have any problems with cooling. And as you heard from that, idle is very quiet, and when it's pushed to 100% usage, the fan is audible, but it's definitely not loud by any means. Now the conclusion for this PC, while I've been sent the 500GB version, it's only $20 less than the 1TB option, which is what B-Link was meant to send me, but that's honestly no issues for me. But as a consumer, if I did order this in 1TB and receive 500GB, it would just be a minor inconvenience. And the same with the UK power plug, but that's an easy fix. For the asking price of the 1TB variant coming in at $619 US dollars and then even cheaper with the $80 voucher that they're currently offering, I firmly believe that this is a solid piece of hardware and perfect to use for media, some gaming, productivity, and more if you don't quite have the space for an all desktop, then this could be for you. With a healthy amount of ports, a clear CMOS button on the front that's handy in case you make an error in the BIOS, you can press this and get it back to defaults. The magnetic power adapter is a real nice touch. Great build being all aluminium, great performance with the right Ryzen, CPU and integrated Radeon graphics, options for upgrading the RAM, SSD and adding an extra M.2 SSD, and if you can get it in the orange colour scheme, which would really make it pop, then I'd easily recommend this. I've mentioned during the review that newer hardware is not my strong point, so anything that runs better than what I'm used to seeing is immediately better in my books, as I've mainly been used to stuff earlier than 3rd gen Intel, so all the latest, fanciest tech in the computing world just goes over my head most of the time. But in all honesty though, I was pleased with the results from gaming and the performance with this. I guess the downsides to this would be the slightly finicky bit to upgrade the RAM and the SSD. With screws that are of different length, a flex ribbon in the way, a fan cable and the power cable as well, you just have to be a bit careful, but you'd only have to do this once while owning the PC, so it's not like it's something you'll have to do all the time. Another thing I'd suggest to B-Link would be possibly just offering the one terabyte option as a default instead of 500 gigabytes. It just makes more sense to me. Windows 11 Pro is also a downside, but that's not B-Link's fault though. It's just not an OS I'd recommend at the moment. Windows 10 is the way to go if you're used to Windows, but you can alternatively go with the Linux distro if that's your cup of tea. I know I haven't tested everything in this review, but I hope I've shown enough for this PC that I do honestly recommend, and I am reading off a script and I sound very robotic, but because this is more of a serious review, I wanted to have this video a little bit more structured and organized than other videos where I just ramble on for several hours talking about something. And that more organized structure is probably a video that's not for everyone, but it's good to try new things. Now, if you'd like to check out the B-Link 
Sir6 Max. There's links in the description to purchase one if you want to. They're not affiliate links or anything like that. I won't earn anything if you click them. They're just there for your convenience. If you want to jump onto Google to check it all out, then you absolutely can. That's no problems. And I also want to say that I was not paid by B-Link for this review, and they in no way influenced my opinions on this PC. They simply sent the unit out for the review, and that's what I'm here to do, is just provide an honest review of this, and I think I've done so. So a massive thank you to B-Link for sending this PC out to me for review. I really do appreciate it, and I hope this review has been more than enough to showcase everything that this little PC has to offer. If B-Link gives me the thumbs up for this review, then I know I've done my job. Thank you very much to them for this opportunity once again. I do appreciate it. And if you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much for sticking around for this one. This was still a rambly review for me, but slightly constructed. And this review was a bit difficult to try and get right, but I tried my hardest with this. So if you're hearing me say this, that means I've succeeded in delivering an in-depth review for you all, and you got some entertainment or learned something new from this review. But if not, and you had to use the timestamps, then that is completely fine. That is why they're there. That is taking a look at the B-Link Sir 6 Max Mini PC, which I've probably said quite a few times in this video. I'm not going to keep a counter though. I hope you've all enjoyed this one regardless. I just don't review a lot of computer stuff on the channel. I just find mobile phones and tablets and all that to just be a little bit more exciting than laptops and mini PCs and all that. But as I said, it is good to try new things. I will be reviewing another mini PC by Geekom at the end of this month, which I hope to compare with this B-Link PC and see which one ends up being the winner for me. And whichever one ends up being the winner, I'll end up using it as a media PC in my lounge room. Otherwise, the next video from me should be a normal, usual, rambly, silly review. So look forward to seeing that one. Thank you all so much for watching this review. I really, really, really do appreciate it. I passed 90,000 subscribers the other day, which is just really overwhelming. So thank you to all who have tuned in and are enjoying the reviews. I really am lost for words, really, to say how much I appreciate the gratitude towards everyone just giving me support and kind words with this little venture that I'm doing. So thank you all for sticking around. And yeah, 100K is feeling like it's just right there. So maybe the end of this year, maybe not, not too sure. We'll see how we go. But as always, everyone, please take care, stay safe, be good people, and I'll see you all in the next video, which, as I said, will be the usual silly rambly stuff that you're all used to, but I'll be looking at the Geekom mini PC at the end of the month. So until the next time I see you all, please take care, keep being awesome, and I'll see you around. I didn't pinch that from anywhere, I promise. I'm sure Zach won't mind. If you like this content, feel free to leave a like or a dislike if you didn't. Thanks guys for watching and I'll catch you all in the next video.